Welcome, dear listeners, to the Carolina Haynes Podcast, brought to you by Recapit Productions and A Darker World. I'm your host, Dan Sellers. She is known by many titles, The Phantom Hitchhiker, The Vanishing Lady, The Lovely Apparition. She is probably the most well-known ghost in the state of North Carolina. She is, of course, Lydia and she is thought to have died in Jamestown almost a hundred years ago. On a foggy night, back in the spring of 1923, a beautiful young woman named Lydia was at a dance. She lost track of time, and then, suddenly, she realized that she was in jeopardy of missing her curfew. She had promised her mother that she would not be home too late. She found her date, and they hurriedly left. The details of the conversation inside the car will never be known. Maybe they were preoccupied with talks of plans for the future. Perhaps the man, determined to have the girl home on time, was simply driving too fast for the poor road conditions. It had been raining, you see, and a thick fog made it difficult to see the curves in the narrow, twisting road. Regardless of the cause, the result is the same. The man lost control of their vehicle, and they slammed into the face of the Southern Railroad Underpass Bridge. You have to remember that cars of that era didn't offer very much in the way of safety and protection. The choice of vehicle was limited for the common man, cars such as the Ford Model T and the like. The man was killed instantly, and the car landed off the road. Lydia managed to crawl out of the twisted wreckage and back to the road. But no one would stop to help her. They must have mistaken her for a random hitchhiker. She died next to the mouth of the bridge. The incident prompted the saddened and outraged community to pressure the town of Jamestown into building a new railroad bridge and straighten out some of the blind curves on the dangerous section of road. Even though the road was straightened out as much as possible and a new bridge was built a couple of hundred feet west of the old one, sightings of the ghost of Lydia have persisted. Years later, in a driving thunderstorm, a man driving home late one night saw a young woman in a white dress. People were far less suspicious back then and he pulled over to offer her a ride. She got in the car without answering. As she got in, he noticed the girl's dress was torn and dirty. The man asked her if she was hurt, but all she said was that she needed to go home before her mother started to worry. He tried to drum up conversation with the girl, but all he got was the same answer. The girl pointed out a house, and the man pulled over to the curb. He got out, ran around the car, and opened the door for her but no one was there. The man, confused but intrigued, knew there was no way the girl could have gotten out of the car without him noticing. But, where else could she have gone? Despite the late hour, he wanted to make sure the girl got inside safely. He braved the storm and walked up to knock on the door of the house. An elderly woman answered, and despite the late hour, didn't seem surprised to see him. The man explained what had happened and asked if the girl was okay. The old woman sadly shook her head and told him that that was her daughter, Lydia, who passed away in a car accident 30 years ago. She said that he had not been the first person who would try to get her daughter home to her. The legend began 30 years prior when a man named Bert Hardison, which is not his real name, was visiting friends in Raleigh. On his way home to High Point, he too encountered Lydia standing under the bridge in Jamestown. Since then, there have been a dozen different variations of the story, but essentially, it's always the same. For example, some versions of the story say that every year on the anniversary of her death, someone attempts to bring Lydia home to her mother, 
other tellings say that she only appears on dark, stormy nights. Sometimes she's been attending a New Year's Eve ball. Sometimes it's the prom. Sometimes the dress is covered in blood. Some stories say that they collided with another car head-on and that both Lydia and her date were killed instantly. Almost as numerous as the different tellings of Lydia's story is the address where she's asked to be taken. Although most versions of the story never say the address, those that do said it was on Johnson Street. Other reports put it on Woodleaf, Maple, or Walnut, even Centennial Street. Some of those streets no longer exist, but street names are known to change, especially in the city of High Point. The path of High Point Road, US 2970A, has been altered since that fateful night. The original underpass is about 100 feet southwest of the new one. During the warm months, it's barely visible from all the kudzu that grows. Yet none of that has stopped the sightings of Lydia. She seems to have found her way to the new bridge. In 1966, Frank Fay was driving down High Point Road late one night. Him and his wife were taking another couple home to High Point from Greensboro. When they neared the infamous bridge, they saw a girl in white attempting to flag down the car in front of them. Even though the car did not stop, the girl tried to open the door as it passed by. Mr. Face slowed, but when he got to the bridge, the girl was nowhere to be seen. He was sure that she had not gotten into the car ahead of them. It had never even touched its brakes, like the driver hadn't seen the girl at all. When Frank asked if anyone else in their car had seen it, they all agreed that they had. In 1976, Tim Beasley and Rick Cook, however, had a different experience. It was late, 1 or 2 a.m., and they were headed toward High Point. It was, once again, a rainy, miserable night. As Tom crested the hill that leads down to the underpass, he saw a girl in a white dress standing on the side of the road. He asked Rick if he saw her too, but Rick looked at him like he was crazy. Rick hadn't seen anything. Frustrated, Tom turned the car around, and this time both men saw the girl. They turned around once more. By now, the girl was sitting on the gravel beside the road. Tom stopped the car, and Rick rolled down his window. Rick leaned out to ask the girl if she needed a ride, but no words came out of his mouth. Drive, Rick said to Tom, quietly as he leaned back inside the car. Tom sighed and urged his friend to ask the girl if she was okay. Just get us out of here, Rick said, rolling up the window. There was something about the tone of Rick's voice that frightened Tom, prompting him to do as he was told. As Tom stomped on the gas pedal, he could hear the girl yelling for him to come back. Tom, of course, asked Rick what the hell he was doing. Rick said that there was something wrong with the girl. She was covered in blood and looked as if someone had beaten her. They were afraid to go back and check. Did Tom and Rick see the ghost of Lydia? Was it just a high school prank? Or was someone in desperate need of help? They didn't realize that they may have seen Lydia's ghost until they told the story to some friends a few days later. They felt guilty about not going back, but something about the scene gave them the creeps. There hadn't been any reports of an injured girl on the news, and the more they talked about it, the stranger the night seemed. Tom says he still thinks about going back there today to see if he can find her. He's still shook up about the experience, but says this time he would try to help her. This time he would make her get in the car, ghost or not. Of course, a story this well-known is going to have its fair share of practical jokesters. 
Many people, mostly high school students, have staged various hoaxes, ranging from very simple to quite elaborate. Some have convinced a female student to walk up and down the road wearing a white dress. Another group was caught dangling a white dress from strings of the road. Upon my first visit to Lydia's Bridge in 2010, for the original Carolina Haynes iteration, I noticed graffiti about Lydia all over the bridge. Handprints made in red paint to look like blood. And even a makeshift Ouija board that had a message to Lydia. On a subsequent visit for geocaching years later, I found all new messages on the walls and even a cheesy attempt at something that was meant to look like a bomb. I will say, I've been down this stretch of the old High Point Road many times myself, even on cold, rainy nights. But I've never seen a hitchhiking girl in white on the side of the road. Usually, as I pass under the bridge for the train tracks, my attention is drawn to the old bridge to the side that's obscured behind the brush. It's what I fondly refer to as Lydia's Bridge. Lydia isn't alone, and Jamestown isn't the only place to have a phantom hitchhiker story. Stories of phantom hitchhikers have been around for hundreds of years. The ancient Romans had a similar tale over a thousand years ago. A hitchhiking ghost appears in a 1602 book about ghost stories. Washington Irving's The Adventure of the German Student from 1824 also features a hitchhiking ghost. Similar tales have made dozens of appearances in dozens of cities. In fact, there is a comparable story to be found in most major cities. Every state of the Union boasts at least one vanishing hitchhiker, including four others in North Carolina. Most of these stories are dismissed as urban legend, but Lydia's story is different. It is perhaps the most detailed story of all the phantom hitchhikers, with a well-defined backstory. Even if the story of Lydia is not completely true, perhaps it's somewhat based on actual events. The village of Jamestown, North Carolina, was settled by James Mendenhall in 1762 and was formally established in 1816 by his son, George Mendenhall, named in his father's honor as a Quaker village. High Point Road, the road where Lydia's ghost is seen, now East Main Street, was one of the first wagon trails through the area and remained nothing more than a packed dirt path for nearly a hundred years. In 1908, it was resurfaced as a macadam road, a method of road construction that involved pressing crushed rock to form a gravel road. These gravel roads presented a couple of problems, one of which was dust. This issue was alleviated with the invention of tarmac. Contrary to modern colloquialism, Tarmac does not mean asphalt or an airport runway. Tarmac was an early version of asphalt that was a mixture of coal tar and iron spark slag. What we know as asphalt today was not used until the mid-1920s. So what's the point you may be asking? The point is the road that Lydia and her date traveled in 1923 was not the well-maintained blacktop that we are accustomed to today. A fact that, coupled with their high speed, probably contributed to the accident that caused the couple's untimely death. A few people have attempted the arduous task of looking for the true Lydia. One would-be investigator undertook an extensive search of newspaper accounts and death records of the early 1920s to try and definitively identify who Lydia may be. She found no death certificates for Lydia in Guilford County for that time frame. Likewise, when the author scoured decades of newspaper articles, she did not find a match to the accident described. However, it should be noted that she also didn't find anything about the building of the new bridge, but that obviously happened. Another reporter searched police records for a field report of an accident in 1923. He tried numerous municipalities and state agencies to no avail. But, to be fair, most agencies don't maintain records for 90 years. 
One woman claims to have investigated the mystery at the Register of Deeds, who was responsible for keeping death certificates of anyone who died in that county. She says that she found five Lydias who died in 1923. Four were quickly dismissed as not our Lydia because the record showed they didn't die in a car accident. She claims to have found a fifth girl, Lydia Underwood, whose death records were missing. It seems too good to be true. This reporter was searching the death records, found a name, but not a record. So where did that name come from? Why has no one else been able to duplicate the findings? So who says she died in 1923? That year was adopted from Burke Hardison's story, the first to tell the story in accounts that the mother told him that her daughter had died, quote-unquote, last year. Some claim that the year is correct, but the name is not. Burke Hardison admitted that when he spoke to the girl, it was so low that he could barely hear her. One author, Michael Reniger, claims to have spoken directly to several elderly people during the 80s and 90s while doing research for a book. There have been numerous fatal accidents on that stretch of road throughout the years, but he found a few people that remembered one from the approximate time frame. Two of them said it had happened in 1923, but the others all gave different years going as far back as 1911. The only thing that they all agreed on, Lydia, was not the girl's name. Those who could recall a name said that it had been Mary, or Mary Ann, perhaps Marion, or something to that effect. An interesting development, considering that one of the few EVPs from under the old bridge is a female's voice saying the name, Mary. However, just to cloud the waters a bit more, almost all of the other EVPs recorded were male voices. Burke Hardison was not the original witness's real name, but a pseudonym made up by the original author to protect his identity. So who's to say that Lydia was not the girl's name? So what does that all mean? Does it mean that she's not real? Not necessarily. The witnesses seem pretty adamant that they saw what they saw. Does it mean that she was indeed Lydia Underwood? It's possible, but I don't think so. Perhaps Lydia wasn't her real name, but a nickname. Maybe her and her mother were only visiting Guilford County and didn't live there. In short, it proves absolutely nothing. And for me, that's okay. And now there seems to be new evidence to suggest that Lydia may not have been the girl's real name. Michael Reniger is one of those people who have been obsessed by the Lydia myth over the years. He's on the verge of releasing his third book on the Lydia mystery. In it, he has claimed to have found a Greensboro Patriot newspaper article detailing the death of Andy Jackson. On June 21, 1920, Annie and Dorothy Beck were both killed when the vehicle they were operating overturned in the vicinity of the infamous Jamestown underpass. Reniger is convinced that Lydia was actually Annie Jackson. And I'll admit, it's a plausible claim. Think about the EVP of the name Mary. I haven't heard that recording, but almost every EVP that I've ever heard is staticky and unclear. Is it a stretch to think that Annie could be mistaken for Mary? Not really. If you're as intrigued about this new evidence as I am, keep an eye out for Reniger's new book, Looking for Lydia, The 30-Year Search for the Jamestown Hitchhiker. One somewhat controversial theory behind Lydia's origin has been presented by a psychic the psychic claims that Lydia could be a thought form, having neither lived nor died. A tupla is a term originating from the Tibetan word for manifestation. It's believed in certain circles 
that if enough people believe that something is true, they can unknowingly cause it to exist. The new being, the thought form, if you will, will carry out the actions that those who created it expected to carry out. Thus, if someone who has never been to Jamestown or never heard of Lydia may still see a girl in need of a ride, pick her up, and try to take her home. As far-fetched as this seems, there's the Philip experiment. Supposedly, a group of psychics got together and made up a fictitious person. They named him Philip. They also wrote a fake backstory for the person. Then, through various other mediums, they were able to contact the spirit of Philip, who told them details that they had written down in his backstory. Personally, I find it more plausible to think that Lydia may not have been the girl's given name. What is truth? At this point, we may never know. After so long, the odds of finding any new evidence is unlikely. But, sometimes, we don't need to know. The story, the legend, sometimes, they're enough. For more information about Lydia, check out Stories from the Graveyard by Cynthia Moore Brown. Pick up a copy of Haunted Historic Greensboro by Teresa Bain. There's also the books Triad Hauntings, Roadside Revenants, Ghosts of the Triad, North Carolina Ghosts and Legends, Ghost Stories of the North Carolina Piedmont, and Best Ghost Tales of North Carolina. All these books were used as resources in the writing of this article. This episode was researched and written by Jeff Cochran. It is narrated and produced by me, Dan Sellers. Please feel free to check out all our other projects. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Wreak Havoc Productions, and I'm on Twitter at Hank vs. The Undead. You can find every episode of our show and everything else that we're up to at our website, wreakhavocproductions.com. Don't forget to check out adarkerworld.com for updates on Jeff Cochran's work. And feel free to email us with your suggestions and queries at recapitproductions at gmail.com. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Tune in then to hear more about those things that go bump in the night.